Okay, so now we are ready to introduce the main object of our study, namely the notion of cycle classes, which are the equivalent of homology classes to chains, modular boundaries, or if you want, it's the equivalent that the higher dimensional generalization of linearly equivalent divisors on a smooth projective curve. So let us start from there. Let W be a variety of dimension B plus one. And I hope this choice lets you realize that something else which would be more important to up than W and that D rather than B plus one will play a role. Uh, we define just like for curves, a morphism of groups from the, this is the rational functions on W, non-zero rational functions as multiplicative group and this map will be called div and it will go to z z minus one z d of that so i will associate to every non-zero the idea is informally again i want to associate to a rational function its zero locus minus its pole, or if you want a zero locus, if you informally the divisor of f is f minus one of zero minus f minus one of infinity. So how do I make this uh, for more formal? There are two ways. So one way is assume that W is normal. And uh, in particular, this means it's non singular in co dimension one means for every v in w dimension b sub variety the local ring recall this is the local ring of w at the generic point of v is a discrete valuation ring and of course with quotient field. K of W, all local rings of a variety have as quotient field the rational functions of the variety. And so then I define the divisor of F to be the sum over V W, V, D dimensional variety of the valuation in O, W, V of F. Remember, this is a discrete valuation ring times V. Of course, you need to check that this is well defined. Uh, need to check. That val O W B of F is non zero for finitely many B. And uh, the, how do you do it? Well, this is uh, since everything is of finite type, you can reduce. To the case where w is affine, then you look at the locus, the open locus where w 
or in general, just look at the open locus where f is a regular function. Its complement is a proper closed subset. Um, and uh, so it is the union of finitely many reducible components and each reducible component have to, has to have dimension at most d. And so there are only finitely many hypersurfaces contained in locus where the valuation is strictly negative. And then you take one over f and uh, you do the opposite. You do the same thing for one over f and you get finitely many on which the evaluation is strictly positive. So idea val o w v f negative even only if v is contained the intersect the uf is empty where uf in w is open is the locus of points such that f is regular at P. This is open, it's non-empty, and so the complement has dimension at most D, and it has finitely many reducible components of dimension D. And then uh, valuation of OWV F strictly bigger than zero is equivalent And so you have the same argument. So this is how you define the divisor in case the surface, the variety is normal. So what is if it's not normal? And the answer is if W is not normal, then you can consider the normalization map. It is birational, hence induces an isomorphism on the fraction fields. And it is finite, in particular, it's proper. And so for any F rational function, you define if F to be N push forward of the divisor of N pullback of F. If you want, you can check in the book of Fulton, there is a direct definition which uses a little bit more algebra in case this is something you like. I like this one because I find I can remember it very well. Uh, there is another approach to this which is as follows. So you take your f and you view it as a rational map to P1. And so what you can do is you can uh, call gamma f its graph. Remember, rational map is a morphism defined on an open dense subset, which is larger than this one. The open subsets where this is defined is uf union u of 1 over f. So it's pretty big. And then you can take the closure. Let gamma f bar. the closure of 
gamma f. And uh, this is the closure as variety, as subset, but it's also the closure as subscheme. This is isomorphic to an open subscheme of W, so it's reduced irreducible of the same dimension, and so the closure is reduced irreducible of the same dimension. And uh, let me consider phi from gamma bar f to w, and this is proper because it's a composition of the closed embedding into w times p1 and the projection from w times p1 to w. And now what you can do, it also has a, another projection which goes from gamma f bar to p1. And uh, let's assume that f is not constant. If f is constant and by assumption non zero we define that uh, the divisor of f is zero. So we don't need f to be constant. If it's not constant, it is dominant. And then we define the divisor of f to be phi push forward of p upper star of 0 minus p upper star of infinite because p dominant p1 non-singular curve and gamma bar f variety of dimension p plus 1, all these things together imply that p is flat of relative dimension d. So you're just taking flat pull back and proper push forward. So a priori, one has to check, first of all, one has to check, find references for this statement, and then one has to check that this definition agrees with this one. We will not do that today, but it's possible. So why do I choose, in fact, it's not my choice, why does Fulton choose to give two different definitions? It's because this is a set, one hand, this is a central concept, so the more ways you have to think about it, the better. In fact, sometimes using this language will actually be useful. And there is another point which I would like to make, that if you look at another approach and you ask yourself, well, when did I use that this is P1? What did I really use? I used that I had a rational map to P1, which was not constant. But did I really use it was P1? And in fact, I did not. So what I could do here is uh, take any non-singular curve and any two points in it. And uh, uh, to be precise, maybe k-valued points. And uh, the al alternative approach is to say we could replace p1, 0, and infinite with c x0, x infinite, c any smooth projective curve over k and x0, x infinite, any k valued points. 
would we get we would get more such divisors but we could still define the, the divisor associated to a rational map and this is a direction in which we will not go in this course but you can pursue it and it leads you to the notion of algebraic equivalence of cycles instead of rational equivalence. Basically, you can do anything you do for rational equivalence, you can do with algebraic equivalence. It's a coarser equivalence relation. It has its uses. For instance, if you have a flat family of subvarieties, they will in general have with a connected basis, flat families of subvarieties of a fixed scheme. It will in general have the classes will not be rationally equivalent unless the basis is rationally connected. So unless given two points, you can find a rational curve joining them, but they will always be algebraically equivalent. And so sometimes it is useful to fix not the rational equivalence class, but an algebraic equivalence class. So when you want to generalize homology to uh, schemes or varieties, sometimes you can use Chow groups, so uh, cycles modular rational equivalence. Sometimes you want cycles modular algebraic equivalence. We will see there is yet another equivalence to come, which applies to smooth varieties. But what I want to say is this is a direction I will not pursue but it is there and it's important, you should be aware of it. Okay, so I have now defined divisors and now we come to the key definition of the course. Definition, let X be a scheme, we fix an integer D, uh, we let Graph D of X be the subgroup of ZDX generated by a divisor on W of F for all. W in X T plus one dimensional sub variety. Let me just call it I the inclusion and F rational function non-zero rational function. So what you do is recall for curves, you know, if we want to define rational equivalence on points, on zero cycles, there is exactly one, one dimensional subvariety of a curve, which is the curve itself. And so we just take the divisors of rational function. But in general, you may have several, infinitely many in general, D plus one dimensional subvarieties, and you just take them all and you take the subgroup generated by them. So this is the group of cycles rationally equivalent to zero. And we let a D of X, the D child group of X, be defined 
as the quotient. So the elements of A, B, X are called D cycle classes, not cycles. So a cycle is an element in Z and a cycle class is an element in A, D. And what you should think of is that this is really an analog of homology, where rational equivalence corresponds to being the difference being a bounded. So this is the key definition. What does it have to do with anything else we have done so far? Of course, it would be nice to compute some of them. We will do it in the next lecture. Instead, right now, I want to focus on a miracle that occurs. A miracle. Occurs, which is theorem. Let one let f from x to y be a proper map then f push forward is contained Proper push forward preserves the property of being rational equivalent to zero. And two, let f from x to y be flat of relative dimension r, then f pullback of the rational equivalent to zero cycles is contained into rational equivalent to zero cycles. So being rationally equivalent to zero is preserved by proper push forward and flat pullback. And so as corollary, proper push forward and flat pullback are defined on chow groups. Corollary given X scheme I, the inclusion of a closed some scheme, and U, the complement, and J, corresponding open embedding, we have natural morphisms A D of Y equals I push forward A D of X equals J pull back A D of E because I is a closed embedding and J is flat of relative dimension zero. And then we have some more miracle, but not so miraculous lemma. In the same assumption, the sequence A star A D of Y. I push forward A. 
straight foot back. A, B. Off you. To zero. Is exact. So this tells you that recall on the cycle level, this was just canonically split. ZD was a direct sum. And uh, on the cycle level, some maps, some parts of the splitting just don't extend anymore. But at least we have some maps and we have some exactness. Not all of it, but some. And uh, so let me comment a few words about the missing proofs. So let me start by the second statement of the theorem. If you assume, which will be a case of a strong interest to us, that f is smooth of relative dimension r, then the proof is just very simple. You take w as a variety of y, you take a rational function, and then the inverse image of the sub-variety is a sub-variety, and you can just pull back the rational function and take the divisor. So this becomes very easy, and for the general flat case, you just have to check that the various notions of multiplicities are, are happening talk well to each other. So you need algebra, but not any special idea. What turns out to be rather tricky is statement one. Because if you have a, a sub-variety of dimension d plus 1 on x, its image in y will be a sub-variety, but it may not have dimension d plus 1. And so you have to do three separate cases. The easiest is the case where the image of the dimension is d minus 1 or smaller. Then basically you get the push forward is 0 and there is no problem. Uh, the next case is where the dimension is the same. So you have a finite cover and you have a rational function above. How do you get a rational function below? Uh, you do something which is called the, the trace. There is a nice algebraic definition of this, which you can I encourage you to look up. But the way I think of it is I take one point here, take the inverse image and then multiply the value of the function at each of these points. And in such a way that I get, say, I get a zero if it's in the image of the zeros and so on. So there are ways to think of this. And finally, there is the tricky case, which is when the dimension via the image of f goes down by exactly one. And then basically the fibers are curves and you have to use the fact that uh, if you have the divisor of a rational function on a curve, it always has degree zero. On a proper curve, it, the degree is always zero. So these are the basic ideas. And here, that it's exact here is kind of trivial. It comes from it being the quotient. And exactness here is also not that difficult. You could ask yourself if you are wise in the world of algebraic geometry, you see a half exact exit sequence and you can ask yourself, are there the right functors that I can put here? And the answer is yes. But this is both outside the scope of the book and it's certain in particular outside the scope of its course. So anyway, these child groups will be the main object of our course.